Well, good morning, everyone. Let me take this opportunity to welcome you to our Sunday school here at uh, Valley Stream. I know I said here at Valley Stream, I'm not really necessarily talking about the location. We're talking about our congregating as the body here. What a blessing it is to be with you this morning again. And if you're joining us here for the first time, welcome to our Sunday school segment. Let's continue to play this song and immediately following the song, or maybe another song I don't know, we'll get right into our discussion. We are on page 85, and that's exactly where we're going to, we're going to pick it up. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and play a song, and then following the song, we'll get right into our discussion. Again, welcome to our Sunday School segment this morning. bow in prayer father we thank you for this opportunity this morning again we'll be able to come and to study your word we thank you for your people who have gathered we pray your blessings upon their lives we pray together you will illuminate our minds and give us full understanding of that which we will be embarking on which is your word in study we thank you again for life we thank you for strength and we ask your blessings in jesus name amen Again, good morning and welcome to our Sunday School segment. We are glad you've joined us, joined us here this morning at uh, Valley Stream. And when I say at Valley Stream, I'm not necessarily talking about the location because the physical location is not the church. Amen? Amen. But we are so delighted to have you with us this morning. Last week, we, we stopped on page 85 and... We were looking at what Jesus told the disciples, that if any wishes to follow him, there were three things that he mentioned that would have been required of them. One, self must be denied. One has to take up his cross and one has to follow Christ. Last week, I spent a good amount of time emphasizing what it means to deny self. And then this week, I want to go back a little bit, not in that one, but to just go back where I actually stopped. I actually started talking about um, taking up your cross and following Christ. Because so many times people just misinterpret the whole concept of what Jesus was talking about in terms of taking up your cross and following Christ. So let's go to page 
um, 85, and according to Jesus' own words in Matthew 16, 24, what does it, what does it take for a person to come after Christ? Um, in other words, what does it take to become a disciple of Christ? Discipleship is viewed in so many different ways in the world today, as I mentioned last week. But I took time to emphasize to all of us the fact that Jesus Christ mentioned that when we decide to follow him, we need to put self aside. Today we're going to go one step further into the, the discussion that we began last week as to how we take up our cross and follow Christ. When we think of the word cross, we're thinking of suffering, we're, t we're thinking of death, separation. And so if a person is going to take up his cross or her cross and follow Christ, there are lots of things that are involved in that. When we think of Jesus Christ going to the cross, dying in our place, for our sins, we are not bringing equal between ourselves and Christ because that's impossible. We cannot die for our sins, neither can we die for anyone else's sin. But Jesus, as we know, is the perpetuation or became the perpetuation, the covering for man's sin. But what does it mean to take up your cross and to follow Christ? Well, the whole mechanism here, as we note, taking up our cross is we bring in one separation from oneself and the world. Separation from oneself and the world. That's one aspect of it that we're going to be discussing. Secondly, it is a complete defense of the whole counsel of God. Pastor Sherby, what in the world are you getting at? What are you talking about? It, that doesn't seem like I'm taking up my cross because taking up my cross means I'm going to be bearing a lot of burden. I'm going to suffer. Well, listen to this. Jesus told us in his words in scripture that they're going to hate you. For what? Why will they hate you? They're going to hate you because you're going to bring a defense to the entire council of God. From Genesis to Revelation. Yep. Yep. They, 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 they're going to they're gonna bring a separation between themselves and you. By the way, they treat you because you're standing on biblical truth. Those who are standing on the core truth of the word of God usually never have a lot of friends in terms of scripture. Because most people don't see it the way God sees it. And if you begin to see it God's way, then the people who, who do not see God's way will not take a stand with you, will not be encouraging with, to you, and, and will not stand with you. They will go right up against you. So when it says, take up your cross and follow me, Jesus was pointing to the things that you're going to need to do in relation to scripture if you follow him. Because the suffering that we the suffering that we endure in our Christian walk must be suffering in relation to scripture. Standing on the word of God, you are going to be persecuted. You are going to be resented. That is taking up your cross. What cross? You're going to take up the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you take up this, this truth and begin to walk with this truth, the world will despise you. And by the way, when we say, when we use the word world there, most of the despising that you're going to experience is right among your, our own people within the body. Why so? Why, it is, why is it within the body? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 tells us, that it is the desire of Satan to blind the minds or to bring our understanding in complete darkness so that we do not understand scripture. He's, he, the word world that is used here is talking about believers. 
not, not the lost world. Their dead in trespasses and sin is irrelevant to them. So if I am not, if, if my eyes are in complete darkness and I'm not able to see spiritual truth and, and, and you're walking in it, how could I agree with you? It is just not possible. It is just not possible. So there we have to we have to defend the word of God. So our defense will cover the entire uh, Bible, the whole counts of God from Genesis to Revelation. So when I take up my cross, when I take up my cross, when I take up that commitment that I made with Christ to walk with him in spirit and in truth, bear in mind that you are going to go up against persecution. Some will separate themselves from you. In fact, don't be surprised if they call you crazy. They might look at you and say, oh, he's nuts. He's gone off the far end. He's not believing. He's not one of the fundamentalists. He doesn't have his core faith whether Arminianism or uh, hypocalvinism or, or, or whatever you want to call it, but, but he's gone. He's not believing what scripture says, but taking up your cross and following Christ is centered around the whole counsel of God. Let, let, let's, let's look at it this way. As you take up your cross and you begin to follow Christ, how do you go with him? Well, you have to begin where he already began. That's exactly where it's going to lead you. And we look, go all the way back to the book of Genesis and look at the very beginning of things. Oh, yes. If you're going to defend your faith, if you're going to put up a biblical and precise and clear and genuine defense of your faith, it has to be the whole counsel of God. So when you take up your cross, and as you begin to walk with that cross, but what, what is your cross? What is that cross? Your cross is truth. Your cross is giving up, denying self, and taking up truth in relation to God's word. And your cross is the suffering that you will bear, that you will undergo all because of your consistency in the word of God. One thing I found out, is that if you, if you take a stand on the pure word of God, most people around you will question your faith. They will. You know why? Because everybody just used to doing things a certain way and just flowing with the crowd. And that's why Jesus made it very clear in Matthew 7, 13, 14, there is indeed a broad road. And he said, there are so many people on it. But he went on to say, there is a narrow path. Who is it that is on the narrow path? He gives a very good description of the individuals. He said, on the narrow path, the, those, are, those who are there, this narrow path leads to eternal life. Now, it is not that those who are, who are on the, the broad path doesn't have eternal life. It's that just their experience is a little bit different. Once you come to Jesus Christ, you're given eternal life. So he's not talking about ungodly and, 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 and I mean, unsaved and saved. They do have eternal life too. But, but, but the, 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 the enjoyment of Christ's coming kingdom makes tremendous distinction there as to what you enjoy with eternal life. And he said only a few find the narrow path. So if you are numbered among the few and everybody looks at you as being strange, don't be surprised. Carry that cross. Carry that cross with its truth and its separation from the world and the suffering that you're going to endure, the resentment from some. Some will laugh at you, some will talk about you, some will do all sorts of things to you. Why? Because you are walking in truth. What, 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 what is one of the first things that we need to bear in mind as we take up the cross, as we defend our faith? 
We have to look at the counsel of God. So we go back to the very beginning of things. That's where we need to begin. And the first thing that we need to look at is, 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 is the fall of Lucifer. That's where it all began. So if I defend this truth, how will they look at me? Or if I believe the stories, then the West Indies would call them an answer stories because they were real. But if I believe truth, if I believe Ezekiel chapter 28, that, that Satan was placed in the garden and then God gave specific instructions to him, set him up as a ruler over the providence of God, and he had an opportunity to walk up and down in the midst of the fiery stones, and then rulership was what God placed in his hands, but pride went in his heart and he defeated himself, sinned against God. God threw him out. Take up my cross, biblical truth, to follow Christ. If you defend that truth, what will they think of you? Do they believe that Satan was in the garden? Do they believe that Satan was given responsibility of rulership? Do they believe that God cast him out? Then we realize that after that, um, Satan's fall affected the world. The world was plunged into darkness, into decadency. And that's why between Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2, we see where at verse 2, and the Bible tells that darkness was over the face of the deep. There was a void being uh, brought in place by the judgment that God brought on the earth all because of Satan's fall. Take up your cross and follow him is the defense of that biblical truth. Go beyond that point a little bit. And notice that now, God, verse 3, start a complete work of restoration to the universe. Complete restoration. Because in Isaiah, we are told that nothing, Isaiah 48 and verse 15, that nothing that God, when God created the world, the world rather, God never created the world void. In other words, he never created this earth with any imperfections or any problems. He created the world perfectly done. But then you move on. If you take up your cross, this is what you're going to defend. Why is it so? Because it's truth. Satan doesn't go up against anything but truth. And so this ruined creation must now be restored. And it took God six days to bring about a restoration of that which was ruined. Having done that, God replaced Satan. We're talking about taking your cross and what you must defend in doing so. Did you know that the sufferings that the Apostle Paul endured, it was all because Paul was proclaiming these truths in relation to scripture. Paul was let down in a basket. Paul was whipped. And he mentioned in Galatians, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He stood. What was he defending? You think Paul just, Paul just suffered like that? No. Paul suffered because of his proclamation of truth. And when I take up my cross and follow him, I just, go, I just don't go out there and busy body and somebody beat me up because I'm meddling their business and I call that suffering. No. The suffering in you with taking up your cross has to do with the word of God, truth. Defense of scripture, standing on truth. So after six days of restoring the ruined creation in that aspect, then God brought about Adam to replace Satan. Now, this is important to understand. I know it is clearly understood by many. Because this is the defense that we take in terms of taking up our cross and following Christ. It has to be centered around the whole 
counts of God. What am I taking up? I'm taking up the truth, the whole counts of God. And when I take that up and I begin to walk with that and practice that as truth, I'm going up against the enemy of God, the devil, and his followers. So God created Adam, placed him in the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. gave him specific commands as to what to eat and what not to eat and so on. And then Satan came right in the same Satan that was previously disqualified and decided he's not going to be alone in his disqualification. So he, he, he deceived the woman. First Timothy chapter 2, 14. He bring about the deception of the woman. And then Adam came along and voluntarily participated of the fruit, effecting redemption for his wife. Just like the Bible said, Christ who knew no sin became sin for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you take up your cross and follow Christ, this is, this is your defense, this truth. And this is what the world is going up against. When, and this is what the church community is going up against. If you were to stand in truth, and some churches are going there today, you tell them the entire church is not the bride, they're going to throw you out. They're going, to, they're going to think you're crazy. They're going to throw you out. Why? Because they haven't really spent time to dig into scripture. And when you look at religion today, when you look at Christianity today, it's amazing the confusion that is among church folks. Here's a brother or a sister goes up and jumping up and making all kinds of nice, speaking in tongues, prophesying, doing all kinds of things. I was just crazy. And by the way, yeah, I had a conversation with somebody recently regarding some core truth of scripture. And, and when I explained certain things to the person, the person looked at me as if I was crazy. They wanted, I guess they wanted to tell me that, that the pastor should be, you know, you're a crazy man. But they just never had the courage to do that. I, 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 at least outwardly. But you can tell when, when they're telling you that on the inside. But you see, my job is not even to worry about that. It's to tell them truth. There are so many things. If you take a stand, if you take up the cross of truth, if you take up your responsibility that God has given you and decide to dig deep and to understand scripture and to lay it out the way it is laid out in scripture, they are going to go up against you. You take a stand in scripture. You go out there and you take a stand. Listen, they have so many different pastoral groups around in different communities where they have pastoral fellowship. And as you become a part of them and you see where these things are going, you become very uncomfortable if you're a man of God and a man of the word. You become very uncomfortable. And as you take your stand on scripture, you are going to experience some resentment. Take up your cross and follow me in relation to what? In relation to truth. That's it. It has nothing to do with anything else. The sufferings that you are going to experience is as a result. Listen, if you suffer otherwise, it has nothing to do with Christ. But it has to be centered around scripture. So the foundation going forth as we, as we continue to lay it and, and as we look back on what God has done, we, we, we study the word of God, we take it as God has given it, and we believe it as God has given it, and we practice the way God has given it to us. Adam came, Adam fell in sin. In Genesis 3.15, God has promised before, brought forth his plan, was not an accident, to bring redemption to the world. God brought redemption to Adam. Genesis 3 and verse 21. What he did? He killed an animal. Do you know that there are some out there that will tell you that Adam is lost? Eve is lost. And they're not redeemable. And God shed the blood of that animal and used that animal's skin to cover them. 
But the animal skin is one part of it, but the shedding of blood was the most important part. Why so? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no what? Remission for sin. So when we take up our cross and we, we are following Christ, these are the things that we're accepting from him, Christ, not from man. And these things will be our defense. As, 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 as Jude said, we are going to earnestly, earnestly contend. We're going to earnestly fight for. We are going to earnestly defend our faith, even if we have to die. Remember, I told you that the cross also means death. I speaks of death, separation. Even if you have to come to this point where you have to die, when you said, deny yourself of certain things, now take up your cross. What is that about? It's about the whole cause of God. You cannot take up your cross. You cannot follow Christ unless you begin to do exactly that which Christ is asking or demanding of you from Scripture. Believe me. Listen. Coming together for Sunday school, coming together for our midday worship service. If we are not ready to put Christ's truth forth and not ours, if we are not willing to, to allow self to be slain and put Christ forth truthfully, our gathering is absolute nonsense and waste of time. Church don't meet to collect offering. That's not why we meet. We don't meet to just jump around and make noise, our noises. We meet to bring edification. We meet to build up the body, to bring an understanding to one's mind so that I'll be better able to live my Christian life and to become an overcomer to the glory of God. Every time we meet, not a minute should waste on doing my agenda or your agenda, not a second. It should all be on Christ's time. Because as we come to him in such fashion, we're coming in his name. So the, when I take up my cross, I am defending the whole counsel of God. And I'm looking at the program of God. Because here, if I don't fully understand scripture, I, I, I am not defending anything that is contextual or that is relevant to my relationship or my walk with Christ. What am I talking about? In fact, Paul tells us that we shouldn't really go out there and spend any time in Timothy and vain babbling and, and arguments and, and going over things, wasting time with people or arguing over things that you can never get to an end. They become extremely eternally philosophical regarding their arguments. It's a waste of time. Absolute waste of time. But when it comes to biblical truth, if you and I know the Lord, listen, it's the same Bible you know. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's not many lords, many faiths, and many baptisms. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Why things are so different with all of us? Why? It's because it is Satan's desire. Understand that. It is his desire not for the, the body to come into a, a synchronizing experience where together we understand the faith. So that when we take up our cross and we begin to follow Christ, we are all going in the same direction. That's it. We're all on the same note. We're all singing the same song. We're all playing the same tune to the glory of God. Not distinctly. Why not distinctly? Because it is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You know what I found out in my Christian walk? It can be a very lonely path, you know. It is. And, and you have, as you take up your cross to follow Christ in defense of scripture, you got to be ready to be alone with God. It can be a very lonely walk with man, but it can be a, a very interesting walk with God. Just bear in mind, <laughs> you're not alone. Listen, th there are many that will walk away from you, you know. They will. They will. 
You get in there and you begin to teach the word of God. For example, let, let, look at this. Look, 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 look at the Christmas celebration. Has nothing to do with God, you know. Nothing. And if you ever take up that cross and decide to stand on scriptural truth and let the world know and the world of believers know that that is paganism in origin, paganism in practice, paganism in everything, they look at you and say, really? But, but Jesus was born and there ain't anything wrong with celebrating Jesus was born. When was he born? What instructions were given to us in relation to his birth? and celebrating his birth. What? What is it there in scripture that we can find? And these things will bring separation. You, when you take up your cross and you begin to walk with God and you take a stand against these things in terms of false, well, false doctrine and, and paganism and, and stand against all sorts of things, they look at it and say, oh my God, but, but something is wrong with him. Everybody's doing it. And we've been doing it for a while and there's nothing wrong with it. I don't think so. But what about the word? What about the word? What about the word? Who, who, do, who, do, you, who do you follow? Or who should you follow? Man? Man's explanation of what scripture says. So when I take up my cross and I I'm following Jesus Christ, I'm looking forward to another thing to what he mentioned. He said he's coming back to judge the world. On what basis is Christ coming back to judge me? He said he's coming back to judge me based on my works, based on whether or not I become an overcomer. The emphasis is on that, overcoming. So when I take up my cross, what am I overcoming? What, 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 am I, what am I carrying this cross of faith against? A worldly system. That's it. But here, the only way I'm going to, be, I'm going to do this effectively, the only way I'm going to effectively carry my cross of faith is coming into a proper understanding of Scripture. I cannot carry a cross of faith in ignorance. In the long run, it does me no good. It does me no good? Absolutely no good. It's like somebody tells you, I need you to fill that barrel of water for me. You got to carry the water on your head in buckets, but then you fill the buckets with stones and pour it um, in that container. It's going to be pure stones. You got to do as you're told, carry water. And if God tells you to carry his word in your heart, like David said, that you might not sin against him, you and I, that's exactly what we're going to need to do. So when the Bible said, deny self, take up your cross and follow him, it, 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 it has to do with you and I coming into a better understanding of scripture. Because as we press along and we go along and we walk in truth, we are going to experience some resistance. We're going to, we're going to. It might take a lifetime for some to even begin to pay attention to truth, but you can't give up. You can't give up. You might just pass right on, die and gone. And after your death, that is when maybe some family members will begin to understand that, hey, whatever he practiced and believed, now I begin to see from scripture that he was right. In your lifetime, <laughs> you might never see your prayer answered. But that doesn't mean that God will not answer your prayer. Look at many of the great men who suffered. Civil rights rulers who stood on certain principles. When were they recognized? After they died. When was Jesus recognized as truly the Son of God? When he gave up his spirit and the place turned into complete darkness <laughs> and those who were with him beneath the cross looked up and said, truly, 
this is the son of God. What your commitment right now to Christ might not be significant to anybody. The, the, the suffering, the challenges, the sacrifices might, might not be anything. And all that you're going through in life might not mean anything. Don't you dare give up. Don't you. Because the Spirit of God will take that example of yours sacrificially, committedly to Christ, and one day touch somebody's life with it. You don't have to go with the entire world, you know. You don't have to do. You might be in a corner by yourself and you might see it might seem so lonely and so alone and so serene. But listen, God is with you. Stand with him. Stand with him. So as we take up our cross, now look at it now. Jesus said he must one deny self, he must take up his cross, the whole counsel of God, the whole concept of truth understanding scripture, getting to know what the Bible teach regarding certain things, the whole counsel of God, everything, not just one thing or two things, but the whole counsel of God. And look what he said, and follow me. Follow who? Follow Christ. Listen, don't follow, don't follow the leader. The leader, my job is not to point you to myself is to point you to Jesus Christ. If I begin to preach myself to you and point you to follow me, then run. Because I am nothing but flesh and blood and I will fail any moment. Yes, follow Jesus. And so we, we are servants of God and we are stewards. God has entrusted us with some certain responsibilities and God is, God is depending on us to carry this out. So when he said, take up your cross and follow him, keep your eyes on Christ. There are so many distractions that are out there and let me tell you something satan brings good destruction to us and it will make it look as if it is god that is enticing you rebuke it because you're gonna find out that is not christ is not everything that glittered as it is gold and here's the thing when jesus said to follow him how do you know that you are following christ turn to the book Listen, don't follow Christ based on your nightmares that you get. Follow Christ based on the word. In fact, in Hebrews 1 and verse 1, God at one time spoke to us through prophets, priests, and kings. How is he speaking to us today? How do I know how to follow Christ today? Because Christ is speaking to me through his word. And there's one thing that I must never forget when I look at the word of God. Second Peter 1 and verse 20. That the word of God that is speaking to me ought to be speaking to everybody as the very same way. God's word does not speak to me differently from how it speaks to somebody else. No, why not? Pastor Sherby, well, in 2 Peter 1, I just mentioned that verse 20 said, no scripture is given by what? private interpretation but all of it was given to us directly from god to men that god set aside and that is the way god is communicating to us so when i look into scripture i gotta look into scripture and see that god is speaking to me from his word do not operate on your instinct or on your brain or how you feel or your dreams or your vision operate on the word of God. In, 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 in John 12 verse 48, the Bible said, that is how God is going to hold me responsible. When I deny myself, when I take up my cross in defense of scripture, and when I follow him, is the same scripture that I'm defending that is leading the path. Same scripture that is leading the path. There are just too many things happening in the world today. Too many things. And, and I've never seen, the world has more prophets now than even in Jesus' time. I'm telling you. 
more prophets, more people are hearing from God, and more people are doing all kinds of, be careful. Self must be put aside. Yes, self must be put aside. You know, you know what's funny? There are some truths that if, you, if people come to you and they ask you a question and you answer their question and, and, um, and sometimes as you tell them truth in relation to the question and they look at you and, and they marvel and they think, but sometimes they, they have no intention of believing that truth, you know. So nowadays when a man comes to me and tells me that he's looking for a Bible-believing church, I usually just keep quiet. Because I know for sure, if he finds a real Bible-believing church, he ain't staying long there. Because what they're, what, what they're actually saying, I'm looking for a church that is in agreement with how I think, what I believe, what I want to practice. That's it. They're not looking for anything that will change their mind. <laughs> I, I'm glad I use the word change because as you take up your cross and follow Christ, you're going you're gonna to experience constant repentance, constant turn away from influences that are unscriptural. You're going to do that. They, they can be good influences, you know, good influences that are unscriptural. And as you, as, as, you, as you take up this cross and you begin to follow Christ, your focus is on Jesus Christ. Lord, is this really what you want me to do? Is, is it okay? Uh, will, will I give the best of impression to a weak brother or a weak sister in my walk? So my focus is on scripture is on truth and, and the more i pay attention to following jesus christ the better i'm able to please god now listen to me carefully i want to say this to you and to me to us if god is well pleased then the brother or the sister who is walking in truth will be pleased also because they're going to see things God's way. The, when I'm not pleased with truth is when I'm resisting denying self. I don't want to take the responsibility of defending scripture. I'll be philosophical and I don't want to just follow Christ. Because there are some that say, you know, following Christ is good, but there got to be something else. I, I can't just follow Christ alone. There, there got to be some excitement to it. There got to be something else to it. So, so, so let me follow Christ, but, but let me look into that. Let me, let me try that too. No. No, come out from among them and be separated, say the Lord. And, 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 and dedicate yourself unto him and him only. That's the purpose of what we're studying here. I, I kind of took the time to... To, to and there's no diversion from the material to in depth explain to us when Jesus said, if you're coming after me, and it has to do with the believer's walk. All of this that Jesus is talking about is the believer's walk, is my walk on earth representing Jesus Christ. My brothers and my sisters in Christ must see me as a living, typical example, faithful. Now, we are not perfect. God is not asking us for perfection. He knows we are not perfect. And he's made provision for imperfection. He said, if we sin, we could come to him. First John 1 verse 9. We can confess it. And he's able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then John tells us, Jesus said, if you say that you have no sin, we're making him Christ a liar. But he's made provision for us. That doesn't mean we're going to go out and do anything deliberate. That's not the conversation here. But we are not to portray that we are, we are better than the other in our walk. We are to just live by example to others. Don't be proud with it. So when I take up, when I deny self, when I take up my cross in defense of the whole counsel of God, and as I follow Christ, I keep my focus on the Lord.
not in anybody else. How do you follow him? Probably next week we'll, if we, we, if we'll, we'll talk about it. How do I truly follow Christ in this context? In, in keeping my focus on him. Through his word. Whatever Christ said in his word, that is how I follow him. And I cannot follow him through his word if I don't know or understand his word. If I don't understand the word, there is no way I can follow him. Look at the direction to which churches are going today, all over the place. No direct path in terms of understanding scripture. No direct path in terms of truth. And it's sad because there is an opportunity for God's people to fall under the word of God. And that's why Hebrews chapter 5 lay the foundation. There's an aspect of milk, a stage of milk, where you are fed on milk. And, and, and that stage is, is, is relevant for, for our development. But then it tells us that, that at a certain time or a point and place in your development, you ought to show that you are ready and willing to graduate from just drinking pure milk. Maybe once in a while we need a little milk, but not every day at a certain stage. Milk can be our only food. We can't just entertain ourselves at a certain time. No, it is not in the Bible. By the way, it's not in the Bible. Not in the Bible. So then in Hebrews chapter 6, he said, when God sees and sees my effort as I, as I take up my cross and begin to walk with him, when he sees my effort in wanting to, to, to graduate from milk to solid food progressively, then, then, then you begin to open my understanding to truth and I begin to see scripture. I begin to see the word of God in that respect. But it's on me. It's on me to deny self. It's on me to take up my cross in defense of a whole counsel of God. It's on me to follow Christ based on his written word. And as we follow Christ based on his written word, let's come into an understanding of that which is directly pointing towards God's people, the body of Christ. Let's, let's focus on what is Christ saying to the body. What did God say to Israel? Is what he said to Israel applicable to me as a nation, as a body? Is what he said to the body applicable to Israel? So you look at it from that context. When God told Joshua, every place that the sole of your feet touch, I'm gonna give to you. Is, is that something he's saying to the body? Is that something he's saying to the body of Christ? What is he saying to the body? How does he speak to the body today? He spoke to Israel in a certain manner and, and, and had expectations of them. What is he saying to us today? And what is his expectations of me as a believer? So when I, when I deny myself what? What I want fleshly? When I take up my cross in the fence of scripture? And when I follow him, at the end of the day, if I keep my gaze on him, most likely, most likely, and I'm saying most likely because it has to do with me, I will become an overcomer, a full overcomer, if I trust in him. And here's what at the, at the end of the day I will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Why do we gather here today? What is it that we've come to do? What is it that we've come to hear? And as we hear God's word today, who we who minister to you, we who share the word of God with you, we are under biblical obligations. Biblical obligation. One, to study, to show oneself approved. That's number one. Number two, I want to make sure that as I proclaim the word of God to those who God has entrusted to the hearing of his word under my immediate ministry, that it has nothing to do with self. 
nothing to do with me. But I am a servant. I am a messenger of God. And I came only to deliver that which God gave me to deliver to his people. The word that God has given me, it usually affects the messenger first. That's it. So as we gather today, so at the end of God speaking to, to us, when I shall uh, have left this place, I must can say and should say and must experience and hearing from God, absolute truth. Something that I take and when I look at it beyond any reasonable doubt, it is the absolute undiluted word of God. I trust that there's a better understanding of denying oneself, taking up one's cross, and following Christ.